What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This is my good buddy Rob Shellman. We have something amazing on tap. Pardon the pun today. It's an amazing presentation from the one and only Sean Z. Paxton, the homebrew chef. Y'all are about to learn how to cook with beer for real. For real, for real. Like I said, this is Rob Shellman. Rob Shellman runs a group called Better Beer Society and a education component of it, Better Beer Society University. Tell the people real quick about that and uh, how that even brought Sean Paxton to our area. Yeah, um, well, Better Beer Society, and we're a Twin Cities-based organization dedicated to education, growth, uh, just sort of overall awareness of craft beer here in Minnesota. Uh, we work with, um, well, we also educate consumers though too by way of BBSU, right. uh, Better Beer Society University. And so I wanted to do a full on cooking with beer course. Um, Cause we, I mean, we've, we touch on all aspects of the industry, not just brewing. So yeah, so I reached out to Sean. Certainly didn't expect a call back, at least in the springtime when yeah. we were having all that winter. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but he did, he called back. Um, we rapped about BBS and what we're doing. Uh, we chatted a little about Cali um, and then what we're doing here in Minnesota as a community. And um, yeah, he wanted to support that. So it was, uh, it was really exciting. So Rob brought Sean Z Paxton out for like three days. It included the presentation you're about to see. And then he did a little beer dinner utilizing all local um, Twin Cities craft brews. It was just, it was a bonkers day. So we're gonna go right into the presentation I warn you, you're going to want to get a beer. Yeah. You might even want to get a sandwich because editing this over the last three or four days, uh, it's just, you're going to get really hungry by the end of this. This dude is a huge food loving machine. So until the other side of the presentation, chop for chop. Brew for brew. Go get a sandwich. I'm telling yeah, you. I'm telling you. So we have a lot to cover, so um, we'll kind of keep the, the questions, if you will, to the end. Um, a lot of things will kind of make sense as we go through this. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Good. Uh, Chip, you can hear me okay? Woohoo! So we'll just dive right in. This is why we're all here, is beer. Um, to me, as a chef, I look at beers and ingredients. The work's already been done when it's in the glass or in the bottle, if it's on tap, however we get the beer, it's already done for us the flavors that are already there, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this is what's fun, is, is that when you look at beer, it's a rainbow of opportunities and flavors and ideas. We can do so many different things with beer and not just drink it. My hat says eat beer for a reason. And this is where you can really add different flavors when you think about all the different beer styles that Rob's been talking about with this whole class. Um, our outline today, we're going to talk about a little bit how we taste, um, how that beer flavor from our tongue gets to our brain, just like any other food product. We're going to talk about beer a little bit, what components are in beer. We're also going to talk about off flavors, which I know you guys have already talked about. I'm going to expand about that a little bit. Talk about beer cuisine, but that's really what I do. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some dishes and combinations that kind of give you an idea of what I do as well as what you can do. This isn't just me. And then some do's and don'ts on how to do it. So we got a lot to cover. So starting right off, I uh, want to talk about our tongue. Um, I think it's really interesting when you think about our tongue. Bitterness is really in the back of the tongue. So as you're drinking an IPA, you really taste it more in the back. In the front, you get the sweet and the salty. On the sides, you get the sour. So think about when you have a lambic or something on the sour side, you get all those nice puckering on the sides. And really in the middle of our tongue, we really don't taste much, which I think that this is a really good thing to think about when you think about all the different elements of how we taste. And then when you look about food and beer and the combinations thereof, especially as we drink beer, how we process it. Um, you look at the unami, so that's kind of like the fifth taste bud, if you will, and that's kind of, to me, a whole sensory thing. You think about soy sauce, you know, about mushrooms, Parmesan cheese, uh, anchovies, full of umami. Another way to add a nice flavor and extra complexity, uh, kombu, MSG, are also another big umami flavors. But you know, these things go all the way up to our head, and if you think about everything that you taste, everything that you eat, you can actually put it into a kind of a database. And that's kind of how I do all the different beers that I've had, which over the last 20 plus years has been a lot. <laughs> and so I can really go back and think about those flavors and how they all work together. And then also to really think about 
wow, like this has tons of coconut, or this has lots of vanilla, or oak, or all these different components, and not just malty and hoppy, but what is that hop flavor? Is it citrusy, is it grassy? And we'll get into that a little bit more. But really thinking about how that process is in our head. And if we slow down and just think about what we taste and how we taste it, food memories, think about your likes, your dislikes, family meals, all these different things all play into this. So this is a beer flavor wheel. It's probably hard for you guys to read it. Um, Rob is kind enough to actually share this. But this is a pretty standard, you know, we got this color and ooh, we got another color. But uh, what's fun with it is, is that you can really look at a lot of different flavor profiles and all the different styles kind of fall into these different wheels that are really helpful. Um, you can look at this later. You can look it up online, the beer flavor wheel. Really helpful tool to really think about what are you tasting? Because if you start with the beer, you know, you can really get a lot out of it as far as really dissecting what you taste. Um, when you think about beer, what is it? You know, so beer is a combination of malt and hops. The malt's really interesting because when you start to think about all the different flavors and malts, you can really get some interesting things. Uh, this, you know, particular, you know, think about malty, toffee, and caramel. What's really interesting with these flavors in a savory application is that if you add caramelized onions, you added roasted garlic, your mirepoix, your classic onion, celery, carrots. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, Sofredo, which is the Italian version, as well as uh, the Trinity from New Orleans, those add some really nice classic flavors to things and some sweetness, just like malt is sweet. Um, you know, when you think about some of your stouts, your porters, your dark brown ales, your imperial porters, um, all those kind of beers, you add different chocolate, different uh, espresso, coffee, all those kind of start to add in a really nice complexity. How those beers, you know, as far as what their flavor is, you can actually start to mimic these flavors in what you produce and what you prepare, so you can actually enhance those flavors. Uh, the Maillard reaction is another great example where the caramelizations of the sugars, what that does also in the malting process, all the way down to, you know, the beer in the glass to the food, it's a very similar technique, and so it's how those layers are, are also added in there. Along with the roastiness, you get lots of that umami, you get that soy sauce, the mushroom. So if you ever put like a stout or a nice porter with some mushrooms or with soy sauce uh, in the Asian flavors there, anchovies and Parmesan cheese, you'll notice a, a really huge umami impact that you can kind of use and play with. You know, if you add wheat berries or oats, you know, whether they're the steel cut oats or the rolled oats, you know, you can also think about, you know, how rye and all those different flavors you can use in a risotto, you can use as just a starch with your plate. All these flavors, again, are naturally in beer. And so you can actually bring those flavors out. If you want to go more on the nutty side, you can use, you know, wild rice, you can use quinoa, buckwheat, uh, as well as millet, amaranth really fun grains uh, that are real healthy for you, as well as just something different than mashed potatoes. Um, and they kind of just add some texture, some complexity. You have grains, just like you do with beer. Other ways to use malt, which is kind of interesting. So you think about spent grain in the brewing process. What's interesting is that you can actually take something like a banana. I took the spent grain and uh, basically encased a banana into it the wet grain right into the oven at about 250 for about four hours. Believe it or not, the flavor of the spent grain went through the banana skin into the banana, and now that banana has all this chocolate, roasty, and even a hint of smoke, because you use like 2% smoke malt, into the banana itself. Now this banana you can totally use in like a you know banana bread, a banana pudding, a banana cream pie, even use this with a curry, and think about pairing this with a stout or an imperial porter, it just brings all those flavors, you know, and we'll talk about this more, but the flavor umbrella. So as you think about like a small little dinky umbrella that barely fits over your head versus one of those big giant ones in a windstorm that blows you over like Mary Poppins. This is where you get all those flavors. This is where you get all those constructs. And they're already there, but now you're just enhancing them because they're in the beer. And whether you cook with the beer or you start to use different elements and different ways to reinforce those flavors, you get something really interesting. On the other side, we have spent grain. So the problem with spent grain is that once it's, um, you know, 
after two or three days, even if it's refrigerated, it starts to go bad, and that's something you really don't want to use. It smells awful, and uh, if you ever forgot to clean your brewing equipment really well, you know what I'm talking about. So now you can actually take that spent grain and actually slow dry it overnight, almost like a dehydrator, the lowest setting on your oven for about eight, 10 hours. And you can actually make like a spent grain powder, if you will. And you can actually use these spent grains, whether it's in bread, you can use it in granola, you can use it in all kinds of applications. Uh, but you can also take that same grain and actually put it through like a food processor, a blender, a coffee grinder, and actually make it into a powder, and then use that in your biscuits, use that into your flatbread or your pizza dough. And depending on what kind of beer batch that you brewed, if you're a home brewer, or if you go to a brewery and get their spent grain, you can do something really interesting where it's so much layers of flavor that regular all-purpose flour or bread flour won't have, and whether you use 100% or 50% or 25%, depending on how much of that flavor you want to come through. But again, these are tools. These are things that you can pull from to really say, hey, wait a minute, this is really interesting. And wow, I can actually put, layer these flavors in in a, con in a comparing way versus a contrasting way to really enhance the overall flavor of the pairing. Now you think about malt and it's sugar, but let's think beyond just malt and just actually playing with sugar itself. There's a lot of different types of sugar. So whether it's in a savory application or a sweet application, you can actually change things. And for those of you in the room, show of hands who've ever done like a beer reduction and it's a little too bitter and you didn't like it. Few of you. So here's the thing is, is that as a brewer, we know what the IBUs of a hop are, and we also know the extract potential of what malt is, and so therefore we can calculate the IBUs as well as the OG or the original gravity, and also the final gravity with the attenuation of the yeast, so we actually have a ratio here. Now with this ratio, when you boil something down, you're concentrating the bitterness and not the sweetness. And the hop oils don't evaporate, but all the aroma, flavonoids and whatnot basically boil out and you're left with something very, very bitter, not very pleasant because it's also out of balance. So this is where you can add different sugars depending on the beer style that you're cooking with to really bring that back. So in case you do over, you know, reduce something, think about like the, the the soft candy sugars, um, uh, dark candy company, they make these uh, sugars that basically they make rock candy. Pull the rock candy out, which is all sucrose, you're left with fructose. That fructose is cooked down in a steam kettle very similar to like molasses, but it doesn't taste like molasses. You don't get that smokiness. You get more of a chocolate vanilla flavor and there's a D, a D2. The D2, I get tons of like dried fruit flavors to it. Really fun in a carbonade, like a Flemish style, dish um, you can do it a lot of different ways into caramel into toffee as you know it's crazy how you can use these different ingredients and even thinking outside the box with there's a, a syrup as well as a sugar and the, the syrup basically goes into the sugar so it's not too much of a difference in flavor but then even like date sugar or syrup basically pulverized dates that have been dehydrated great flavor think about that with your doubles even some of your doppel box it really has a nice flavor Jaggery, which is an Indian palm sugar, has that kind of coconutty, malty, vanilla-y kind of a flavor. Again, think about that in a curry, and then with the stout, it kind of balances things out a little bit more. Even brown sugar, the piconcillo, which is the Mexican cone sugar, which is an unrefined sugar, lots of rum flavors. So if anything's barrel-aged in a rum barrel, you'll be seeing a lot more of those. I know lots of people are buying rum barrels right now, not just bourbon barrels, because it's been kind of overdone. You can actually add that flavor into your dessert or into your dish by using just a little bit of the piconcillo or turbinado sugar it also has that rummy note. So then let's talk about hops. You know, hops are flowers. Um, I love to use them, but yet they're interesting because they are bitter and the longer that you cook them, the more bitter that they become. So when you think about how you cook and if you're using hops in cooking, how you want to use that and get those flavors. That bitterness is really the key is because we need bitterness to balance things out. Think about how we've evolved as, as a society where Belgian endive and arugula and radicchio are all really bitter vegetables. Even artichokes are bitter. Those flavors are kind of interesting and even if you look at the cold craze with cocktails and using bittering you know, components, those things add complexity. If it's just sweet, it's not fun. If beer had no hops, it would be pretty boring. 
So this is where to think about bitterness and how we use it, but to use it in you know restraint and not go completely hog wild and go nuts with it where like, whoa, you know, so that's kind of what's kind of fun to think about these things. So thinking about how you layer that into a, a dish, it's really kind of an interesting thing. You know, and then the possibilities in the kitchen um, for the World Beer Cup dinner for 2,000 people in 2010, I made uh, about 100 pounds of hop salt. So we basically took a real coarse sea salt and layered it with uh, whole cone hops into a sealed container for about six weeks. And every three or four days, I'd shake the whole thing up and mix it all up. And all the flavors and the lupulin from the hop cones went into the salt and actually flavored the salt. And then this is a way that you could do as a finishing salt. Therefore, there's no cooking, no extra residual bitterness, just the flavor of the, the hops in the salt. Um, another way is to do a hop extract. If you think about vanilla extract, almond extract, and cooking, take vodka with some hops and pick the hop or the hop blend that you want to use, Centennial, Amarillo, Willamette, you name that type of hot, noble hops. You can do this actually with all different kinds of hops. Let it sit in a dark place for about a week, strain it off, and you have this amazing hop extract. This hop extract you could add to cream cheese and put it on your bagels. Now we have the Centennial Hop Cream Cheese, even hop pesto. When you're making a pesto, think about some of the, the, the hops that you get when you think about you know, the herbally undertones, you know, oregano, thyme, rosemary, uh, even sometimes lavender. Um, you think about uh, chervil or you think about even the bay leaf. All those flavors can be re-expressed in hops. So by using just a couple hot cones into your pesto, you get some amazing flavors as well as a little bit of that bitterness. But if you're using the same hop that's in the beer, and if you don't know, look it up online. Beer Advocate, Rate Beer, they talk about, even the brewery themselves talk about that beer as far as what ingredients, sometimes it's even on the label. And so now you can say, oh, this has Cascade in it. I'll put a couple Cascades in there and boom, the pairing's even more natural. So we've also talked about um, hop oils. So we can actually take hops and infuse it into olive oil. I just did a roasted pistachio oil and then actually added in Saz hops, which are kind of spicy. And if you put that over a very low flame and we don't even want to bring it to a boil, like basically bring it up to like 150 degrees and just let it steep for about an hour, taste it, and if it needs longer, go a little longer. And then strain it out, and then you can use this as a salad dressing or a little sauce over something. And again, you're adding those layers of flavor into a dish. This is another great example where when you look around the circle, you know, we have spicy, floral, fruity, citrusy, herbally, grassy, earthy, evergreen. All those flavors are in hops. Think about flavors that we taste Think about how those layers of flavor from the hops can be reintroduced into a dish in a real positive way to enhance those hops in the dish. So hop oils, this is a slide from Matt Brendelson from Firestone Walker, a good friend of mine. He really did a really neat thing where he actually broke it down, and this is for all the molecular gastronomy geeks in the house. So you can actually look and actually understand these different compounds from that level to see like there's a reason why Cascade hops, the dominant hop in uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, when you look at that it tastes like grapefruit. It actually has the same chemical component that makes grapefruit grapefruit. This is a great way so you can actually take grapefruit rind or zest, dry it out, make it into a powder and sprinkle it over something that you're pairing with Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And guess what? It brings out that grapefruit flavor even more. So this is where you can look at all the different levels and where does that woodsy flavor come from, or the floral or the spicy. It's just really kind of a fun way to look at it. Now let's also think outside the box where we talk about gruets. Gruets are made the beers that before hops were really available and Czechoslovakia was doing what they were where they wouldn't share the hop cone. It was actually punishable by death to actually share the hop plant with anybody else. And so it was pretty interesting how other beers were brewed with different spices. So you look at like coriander and uh, lemon peel into a wit or orange peel into a wit. You think about like cumin, peppercorns kind of add a nice spiciness. Uh, you look at the beer Panapop from Destruce in Belgium. They actually brew with uh, thyme and it really adds a nice layer there. And these are culinary herbs that are being used in the brewing process, which I think is really cool because a chef and a brewer, I think, are very, very similar. Since I brew and I'm a chef, I see it all the time. But bay leaf, you think about like 
the bison honey basil ale. It's refreshing, it's good for you. It's actually an aphrodisiac for all those out there. So it's kind of a fun thing. The trade winds, again, is brewed with fun things. Uh, there's a beer you probably won't see out your way, but Moonlight Brewing, Brian Hunt does some really fun things where he actually dissected what a hop tastes like without using a hop when we had the hop crisis about three years ago. And he actually used a combination of cilantro stems and Italian leaf parsley and some bay leaf and some habanero or uh, jalapenos and a whole list of things that basically all these little components and these proportion and ratios, when you have this beer out to lunch, there was no hops in it, but it tasted like hops. You too can play with different things and think about what you like about hops and then kind of play around and, huh, what about this? What about that? A little bit of this. And he also did another one that I think was really cool is uh, called Working for Tips, where it was a brown ale as a base, but he added redwood branches along with some rosemary and a few other things to get these really resinous flavors that you would from some of those resiny, foresty hops. And you got a great flavor there that was really neat. So why cook with beer? Um, so one is to think about that beer you want to cook with. Think about is it a brand, is it a style that you want to use? Is it a seasonal beer? What season are you in and what vegetables, what produce can you get from the farmer's market that will enhance that? Is there a theme to your dinner? Are you doing Moroccan? Are you doing Thai? Are you doing sushi? Are you doing Korean? I mean, it goes on and on and on. So you can all use these as base concepts to where you want to build your dinner, whether it's one course, whether it's multi-course. Thinking about cuisine, thinking about dietary constraints. You know, if you're vegan, you're vegetarian, you want to do different things. Use these different things to kind of start the process and think about the beers and the order in which you want to put the beers. It's a big part of a doing a beer dinner. You don't necessarily want to start with a big barley wine or imperial stout. You want to use something that's a little bit lighter by the end of the evening, especially like I do a lot of 12 course and 16 course dinners, that when you get to that 16th course, you're going to have palate fatigue. But the carbonation of the beer is helping it out. And when you really look at the overall flavors and the constructs, you get bigger and bigger flavors and bolder with your dishes, you build up to something and you kind of make it light and palatable and all the way up to really strong because your palate and the fatigue. So you can kind of use these different things as a starting point. With that, you know, thinking about beer as an ingredient, we talked about this a little bit earlier about how we taste. So think about complementary flavors versus contrasting flavors, and think about what the beer is going to do to the dish. You know, there's stock, there's water, there's all these liquids that we add to dishes. We can actually use beer, you know, as a, as a low pH, like with a goose or a lambic, to drop the pH just like we would with the vinegar or lemon juice. Instead of using those things, we can actually use beer. All these things can actually enhance the pairing naturally. So this is where, let's start thinking about beers and beer styles. Um, IPAs, double IPAs, pale ales, not the best beers to cook with because why do we enjoy them so much? We enjoy an IPA because of its hops. We enjoy an IPA because, you know, it has these flavors of citrus, floral, herbally dank, however you want to describe it within that particular IPA. And think about those flavors. Those flavors do not cook very well. They volatilize off, they're all gone. So this is where, the non-cooking way, so you can make a ceviche, okay, a cooked fish in lime, lemon, orange, tangerine juice. Depending on what hops that you're tasting and what citrus flavors are pulled out, you can actually adjust your ceviche to use those. The acid actually cooks the fish, so you slice your halibut, your snapper, whatever fish you want to use, real thin, put on some of that, a little bit of beer, maybe some mango, some cilantro, some red onions, maybe a habanero, or, you know, serrano, depending on your heat level, and let that sit for about two hours in your fridge, and then pull it out, taste it, and when it gets to the point where you're ready, like, wow, that's done, strain it off or else it'll continue to cook, and then at that point, pour the beer you want to pair with it right over it, and let that sit till you're ready to serve. Now, you can put this in a margarita glass, and then boom, you have something really fun and interesting. But you can also use that beer into a foam, you know, the molecular gastronomy stuff. You can actually make a beer foam on top of it that re-enhances what a beer looks like. We're dissecting how a beer looks and using that in. You could also pour a little bit of beer over raw, like sashimi and almost do like a crudo. That's what this is uh, pictured next to it with a little bit of fennel fawn on the top, a little bit of uh, orange and tangerine mixed together, and then just some really nice yellowtail, and then also like the hot pesto that we talked about earlier. But you don't want to braise with an IPA. Um, 
You can, but you have to be very thoughtful in how you do it. I had a brewer friend of mine said, hey, I don't, you know, I want you to cook with my double IPA. And I'm like, I don't cook with the IPAs. He's like, no, I want you to. Please try it. And I said, okay, let me try it. So I really thought long and hard. And we talking about that bitterness and sweetness ratio with how we design a beer in the brewing process. But well, we can do the same thing. So if you think about a mirepoix, onions, carrots, celery, leeks, shallots, you know, all those things become very sweet. Carrots are very sweet. Onions, as you caramelize them, become sweet. They become a little bit more bitter, too, as you caramelize an onion. It brings out that bitterness, that sweetness, almost like a caramel. So you can actually cook these down, use three times, four times what you normally would do, add a lamb shank, brown that off, and then put it into a container that you can seal, whether it's with plastic wrap, an aluminum foil, or a tight-fitting lid like a Dutch oven, and actually fill it up with like half chicken stock or beef stock, and then some of the IPA that has a lot of citrusy flavors. Seal it so there's no evaporation loss. Low heat, 250, four hours, five hours, till that lamb shank is almost falling off the bone. That flavor will impenetrate into the lamb, and then after it's cooked, pull it out, flake off the meat, put it like an arugula sandwich with some like arugula, a really nice hoagie roll or brioche bun, a nice little aioli, and as you make the aioli, take a couple tablespoons of that braising liquid, and now you can actually cook with an IPA. So actually, I proved myself wrong, but, this is where you really have to think about it. So this is really the art of the chef. You know, all you guys can be chefs. It's just a matter if you spend enough time and you geek out long enough. I think about food way too much and I think about beer just as much, so I don't know. I think I'm in that beer geek, beer chef thing. But uh, to me it's really about just taking an ingredient, whether it's a beer, a protein, a vegetable, a starch, and thinking about it. And then overlaying an idea, a theme, a concept, even a food memory over it and then using that with a different technique to enhance it. And then you can do a little bit of experimentation to make it just right. And then you have to adjust the flavors and think about that salty, sour, sweet, bitter that we talked even earlier. And you can adjust the seasonings thereof and then you can actually create a dish, whether it's meatloaf, whether it's mashed potatoes, whether it's risotto, pasta, I mean, it's endless. You can do this with cake, you can do this and we'll get into this some, some more, but this is really, the, this is the core of what I want you guys to realize, that it's just taking those elements and designing it from the ground up. So beer cuisine, what is beer cuisine? Um, this is something if you do a Google search, nothing pops up. Um, I'm working on a cookbook to define this and help you guys better, but there's so many different layers of flavor, but this is where you can take it any number of directions. And so to really think about, you know, there's no international borders. It's not like Thai food or French food or Spanish tapas. It really, it can be overlaid with any cuisine. And it's just really enhancing the dining experience. To me, the, the second part of beer cuisine is really thinking about beer. We have a head, we have carbonation, we have, you know, something to look at. We have fun glasses. So we can use those glasses as a vehicle to hold a moose or a trifle. We can take fruit, like with an IPA, and we have all those citrusy flavors. We can take grapefruit and car car oranges and blood oranges and actually put those into a corny keg, seal it up, force pressurize about 30 PSI, put it into a cold place for an hour to two. It'll actually carbonate the citrus. and It'll actually become fizzy. And once you open that keg after you bleed it, you can use it and it'll be carbonated for about 15 minutes. It's another way to increase because think about most beers are carbonated. So that carbonation, it adds another layer of the pairing, you know, beer foams, pop rocks. I used a dish that this is where it was basically a panna cotta made with West Mall Triple and I took um, the strawberries and marinated in West Mall Triple and I did a little bit of like a, almost like a biscuit kind of uh, streusel topping concept off to the side put a little bit of edible flowers on it and then sprinkled the whole thing with pop rocks. And so as you were eating it, it was popping in your mouth and people were like, dude, this is insane. And it just brings back those flavors. And this is where, this is something you can buy. I mean, you can actually buy unflavored pop rocks and actually flavor your own. I don't know, I was a kid, I like pop rocks and my teeth never blew out. So, but this is where it's fun and it's just thinking imaginatively and your own personal likes, dislikes, and your food memories, enhance them with this whole process. So this is where, too, beers for breakfast. I don't know about you guys, but I love a good brunch. So we have 
uh, donuts made with uh, Firestone Walker 12. Um, we have bagels that are, this recipe will actually be in the next issue of Beer Advocate magazine. This is a stout rye bagel. I put hemp seeds, poppy seeds, sesame seeds. Let me tell you, it's the best bagel I've had in a long time. Other breakfast ideas, you know, you can do poached eggs in beer. So think about a wit beer or even worts if you want to be really creative. Um, instead of a beer or a Bernays, you can do a beer naze. So using a beer, reducing it down, and then adding in your eggs and, and making a nice sauce that way. Smoke salmon, but do not put salmon with hops. Salmon has a lot of omega-3 fatty oils, and the hop oils make salmon taste very metallic and tin. Not a very good pairing, but you can still do a hot pesto over your eggs, a little bit of sautéed spinach underneath for an, a fun eggs benedict, if you will. Um, beer braised pork belly instead of bacon. Hey, it's kind of fun. As well as, you know, you can make porridge. So if you take wort or first runnings and add that to your oatmeal, you have the best bowl of oatmeal you've ever had. Um, and it goes on from there. Brunch. Waffles, chocolate stout waffles with uh, stout uh, soaked cherries with a chocolate espresso whipped cream. Does that not sound good? I want that every morning for breakfast. Nobody makes it, but I do. <laughs> um, you know, we already, uh, but you know, porter, put porter into your favorite pancake recipe. It's amazing what it can do to your pancakes. And then thinking about what you do with it, a malted mascarpone whipped cream. Lunch ideas. This is again, it's endless. Uh, on one side we have duck braised and stout. Added some cherries, some humble fog goat cheese. Add a little bit of orange zest into the masa dough. Made that into a tamale. You can't tell me that, you know, cherries, stout, chocolate, and orange don't all work great together anyway. And then you add duck, which is rich and gamey, into a tamale. Yes, I like twos. Um, the salad, I played up bitter orange with an IPA, brine the chicken. Now that flavors all the way through the chicken, now you can grill it, roast it, bake it, however you want to do, and the flavor on the inside of the chicken is not going to change. It's not going to be too bitter. A Reuben, who doesn't love a good Reuben? This is where you can deconstruct it. What is the meat? Does it have to be, you know, brisket? Can it be something else? I use lamb. Uh, lamb cheeks, you can use pork cheeks too, and then you do a stout pastrami brine, the recipe is on my website, and you can actually cure it just like you would corned beef, and bam, you have the best, juiciest, tastiest, uh, you know, meat that you can for a sandwich that it's like, hey, it doesn't have to be so pedestrian, and you can go to any grocery store, talk to your butcher and say, hey, get me five pounds of lamb cheeks. You will thank me, they are amazing. Beer and barbecue. This is where you can actually inject beer into your barbecue. You can brine. You can do all kinds of crazy things with this and also into your barbecue sauce. Swine. Who doesn't love a good pig? So this is where you can do a beer brine or braise in beer and get something kind of fun there. You can make it into an awesome pulled pork sandwich. I mean about like a smoked porter doing that as a beer brine, recipes on my website, and uh, basically you already get the smoke flavor right into it, so if you want to use your smoker, you can. If you want to put it in your oven, you can do that too. Slow cook it overnight and you get something really crazy. Now you can use that as your base for your sandwich. Carnitas, who doesn't love carnitas? Homemade sausage. I use beer in my sausage making all the time now. By the way, I'm sorry if you guys are getting hungry. I'm starving, so even desserts, brown ale crepes. Do that with uh, a malted ricotta inside as a filling. Did uh, a cherry orange uh, stout sauce, almost like a compote over the top. Put that with a holiday beer, insane. So now we're just gonna get real quick just to sum this all up. So understand the beer style. Think about what you're playing with. Taste it, taste it again, taste it again. Think about flavors, put it into context. Like what are you tasting when you taste that beer? Play it up, think about a Hefeweizen. A classic Hefeweizen from Germany has banana and cloves. Think about using that into a banana cream pie. But also another trick is, is that when you're cooking, especially a long cooking, save a quarter of your beer aside. Try not to drink it and use it at the very end to refresh all those flavors. Really great way to get that flavor across. And again, like we talked about earlier, is that if you do over-reduce, go ahead and put a little bit of sugar and pick your sugar, honey, agave, whatever you want to use, and now you get something really fun. Parting thoughts is play with your beer, play with your food, 
it's fun. I get to play with food every day. You know, add beer pairings to every menu. If you have three different beers, put that with whatever you're having for dinner and go back and forth and see what you like and why you like it. Seasonal beers, like seasonal menus. Think about what is in season, what inspires you from the farmer's market or your local market and play up those flavors and the beers. Try new beers with a variety of different foods. You know, have friends over, have some cocktails, enjoy yourself. And then train your palate. What are you tasting? Think about that. The possibilities are endless. I mean, it really, when you think about all the different possibilities with all the different beer styles that haven't even been brewed yet or you can't get in your market, let me tell you, it's so much fun. And with that, my email, my Twitter, my Facebook, uh, and then also I have a podcast on the Brewing Network called The Home Brewed Chef. Um, I talk about all kinds of different recipes for two, three hours at a time. You got a road trip, you're commuting to work, uh, I guarantee you will be hungry. So think about that before you listen. Um, that's my disclaimer, I'm sticking to it. Um, thanks again to Rob and all you guys for coming out and uh, it's been a real fun day. So, hope you guys enjoy. I don't know about you, but I am very hungry now. That was a lot of information to digest in a, in a very small amount of time. Let's go cook something. Yeah, it was kind of funny that watching your students there, like everyone was taking notes, but they would totally kind of get lost. He was such a great presenter that the tangents and the jokes and the real life experience were almost more potent than the bullet points. Yeah. 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 It's uh, and I, I was, it, it's funny because I was walking around um, and just kind of taking pictures or making sure that, you know, we had some samples for, for students and, you know, it's as they're writing, you know, they sort of like had to whip. Wipe some of the uh, the saliva as it was dripping down on their ink notes, but uh, oh. no, yeah, it's a uh, very very informal uh, stuff. And just watching him, I mean, uh, that was a treat. That yeah. was a that was a true treat for me to be able to just ride along with him. I had him in town for four days, um, and so I mean, we you know just learning from somebody with uh, with his brain and how he thinks about things. I mean, we we chose those. Um, we did a we did that beer dinner. Yeah, and you got to cook alongside him. Yeah, how awesome! Sous chef. Yeah, Rob. yeah, that was my first experience as a as a, as a sous chef in a in a commercial kitchen, and you know, talk about nerves. Yeah, you know, sitting there with uh, with the master. So um, that was uh, that was quite the experience. Just real quick from your real life experience, how does his brain work when he's in cook mode? Not when he's like, oh, I'm clean and everything's cool. We're drinking beers. We're talking like when he is in like. <laughs> <laughs> like how yeah. does it go down honestly i thought he was gonna you know you hear the the, the, the stories of, of chefs and you know just being real beep holes you know <laughs> but uh he was he's really he's really super chill um and that's it's his world i mean he's it's almost in his zen spirit you yeah. know that uh that I mean, he just he in, and that comes through in, in the kitchen. I mean, he's constantly having me try things as we were as we were cooking yeah. and tasting as we go, and that was a that was a really important piece um, of cooking, yeah. you know, with beer. So, um, yeah, it was a. I, I certainly wasn't uh, getting. I didn't get any sort of Gordon Ramsay or anything like that out of him. So, <laughs> one thing that kind of surprised me too is, you know, a guy like that. You think he knows his 101 tricks, and that's all he's got, but. He, he came to that presentation, he had just come fresh off a tour of the RAR malting facility in Shakopee, and he was almost unable to think about his presentation because what he had just seen that day of the full-scale malting and all the things and the components that that involved, he was just like, all I want to do is like sit down and write notes on what I could do with malt and what malts can do for me. And he's like, I almost, I'm not ready for this presentation. So he's always learning. He's not stuck yeah. in his 101 tricks. And I think that's yeah. kind of the home brewer in him as well. Is like, you know, you never kind of find your box and stay in it. Absolutely. No, and that's one thing that he, he they, it was sort of his mantra is I'm, I'm always learning, you know. And, uh, you know, from, you know, just learning about, you know, our, our great brewers that we have here and just the different flavors um, or versus, you know, just incorporating a, a Minnesota palate. Mm -hmm. you know in and trying to find that right balance and so that was a lot of fun to work with him on um on just trying to find that that unique menu and, and hopefully that that came across at the dinner so yeah so we edited maybe 15 or 20 minutes out of that actually for what you just saw just to keep it somewhat short if you want to see or uh if you want to see the slideshow the full slideshow and hear the audio from the second session yeah that's going to be at BBS's and BBSU's website. Also, Sean's website. We'll hyperlink those under 
the episode. We'll also hyperlink every way imaginable that you can find Sean Paxton if you didn't write down all that contact information. Definitely want to thank Sean, BBSU, and Rob. Sure. The Republic, both locations for the education component and for the dinner. Thank the Bruin Network for putting Sean out there as well for so many people to hear. I've never seen somebody talk about a recipe for three hours but or heard them <laughs> but i appreciate that they give them the outlet to do that as well and homeboy rob shellman here is quite a little beer chef himself he does something called tuesday test kitchens test kitchen tuesdays oh, yeah, yeah chop for brew yeah no, yeah I, I get it <laughs> uh test kitchen tuesday test kitchen tuesday okay yeah. And well, we're not going to edit it out because yeah, that, no. that was real. That was test kitchen. But test tell them where yeah. they can find that, and we'll link it too. But kind of tell us the idea between TTK, TKT, TKT. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> test kitchen Tuesday. It's basically just um, it's it's a way that I can connect with with the community, you know, by way of social media. Um, and simply, all it is is I go in the fridge and I pull out what I have or just different ingredients, and in, you know, in the house, and uh, and I cook with uh, them. Sometimes I cook with beer, other times I just pair with beer um, and I just sort of lay out some of the, you know, the, the principles uh, of pairing or why I chose that beer or why I cook with that beer. Um, and so, and a lot of this has to do with Sean. I mean, it's a, Sean, was, Sean was a huge, huge inspiration to me um, and is partly responsible, at least for certain aspects of what I'm doing with, uh, with Better Beer Society. I would say nothing less for what is actually happening right here on Chop and Brew. So, Tech, check out the TKT. We're gonna link that. I, I have a feeling you might see some of that in the future on CMB meets TKT. Um, yeah, we've talked enough. You've got a lot of, of notes. You need to get into the kitchen, get into the home brewery, figure out how to utilize both of those things. Till next time, you got anything else, man? I don't think so, man. I'm hungry too, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> All right, man, chop for chop. Brew for brew. Holla at your boy. TKT. <laughs>